Well, welcome everybody to the Heritage Foundation. My name is Joseph Laconte. I'm the director of the Simon Center here uh, at, at the Heritage Foundation, Simon Center for American Studies. We've got a great event ahead here. Let me just frame the discussion for us very briefly, and then I'll introduce very briefly uh, our panelists, our speakers here. Uh, a few months before the end of the First World War, when the white Russians were fighting to overturn the uh, communist regime in Moscow, President Woodrow Wilson authorized the deployment of about 13,000 American troops to help them. <laughs> well, Hoover, who led the uh, U.S. Uh, relief efforts in Europe uh, there uh, after the war, he told Wilson it was a mistake. It would be better to allow Bolshevism to collapse on its own. Here's what, uh, here's what Hoover wrote to the president. No greater fortune can come to the world, he said, uh, than that these foolish ideas should have an opportunity somewhere of bankrupting themselves. The foolish ideas, of course, being communism, uh, Marxism, uh, Leninism. Hoover, of course, is right about the moral bankruptcy and the inevitable collapse of the communist experiment in Russia. But Hoover could not have anticipated the immediate horrific consequences of this ideology. A severe drought aggravated by Vladimir Lenin's collective system of agriculture by which the state seized the property and the produce of Russian peasants while it left the Soviet economy in ruins. And so by the summer of 1921, tens of millions of people are at risk of starvation. And in desperation, this is the remarkable thing, in desperation, Moscow turns to the West, to the West, for aid. Hoover responds in the July 23rd telegram that sets in motion the largest and most successful humanitarian relief effort in history. At its peak, this program is feeding about 10 and a half million people a day. You heard that right. The population roughly the size of New York City is being kept alive every day for a period of months by the United States. Now, let me briefly introduce our, our panelists today. We're going to uh, unpack this incredible story. Uh, Bertrand Petnad, research fellow at the Hoover Institution, a lecturer in history and international relations at Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Petnad is educated at Boston College uh, and the University of, the, of Vienna, received his PhD in history from Stanford. He's written or edited several books about the Russian Revolution, and his first book, the big show in Bolo Land, the American relief expedition to Soviet Russia in the famine of 1921. This is groundbreaking. Uh, one reviewer for the American Historical Review called the book massively researched and hugely en engrossing. And that's an understatement. The book is the basis uh, for the documentary film uh, produced by PBS. Excellent film on the topic. Dr. Poutenout has a deep understanding of the aftermath of the communist revolution, how it destroyed the Soviet economy, ravaged the lives of countless millions of people, but then came the humanitarian intervention. No one has done more to tell the story of the personal triumphs and tragedies of the American relief workers and those they serve. No one better understands the confrontation between the defenders of democratic capitalism and the Bolshevik thugs and comm commissars. We could not have a more knowledgeable scholar to discuss this topic. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Poutnow. Let me introduce George Nass briefly, and then we'll turn it back over to, uh, to Bertrand. George Nass, widely considered the most important historian of American conservatism. Uh, when his seminal book, The Conservative Intellectual Movement uh, in America Since 1945, when it was released back in 1976, one reviewer called it literally the first and last word on the topic. So I won't say any more about it. Dr. Nash received his Ph.D. in history from Harvard. He's an independent scholar, historian, lecturer, specializes in 20th century American political and intellectual history. Dr. Nash is also a leading authority on the life of President Herbert Hoover, who's so central to our story. Dr. Nash is featured in the PBS documentary film Landslide, a portrait of uh, President Herbert Hoover, and in the PBS documentary The Great Famine. Dr. Nash is the author of the definitive three-volume biography, The Life of Herbert Hoover. The second volume of the series, Hoover the Humanitarian, was praised mm -hmm. by one reviewer as a memorable portrait of a man who was a personified combination of idealism and power. There's a phrase, the combination of idealism and power. I think that's an apt description of America as it entered the world stage in the aftermath of the Great War.
like no other nation in history, the United States has attempted to project its economic and military power in accordance with its democratic ideals. Join me now, friends, in welcoming our panelists. I'll turn it over to Dr. Bob now. Take it away, Bertrand. Thank you, Dr. Lacanti, uh, for that very warm introduction and uh, pleasure to be here. Let's get right to it. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of this mission uh, that Dr. Lacanti sort of sketched in. So we go back a century. It's the summer of 1921, and there is in Soviet Russia a catastrophic famine. Uh, millions are threatened with starvation and disease. Uh, most of them, and I'll have a map up in a moment, are situated in and beyond the Volga River Valley. Lenin's government stalls. I think the, the, the fact that it waited months to turn to the West for help cost many, many, many lives. But eventually, uh, it does allow a call for help to go out. And they were forced to do it. Vladimir Lenin's government is forced to do it, looking for uh, foreign assistance. And let's see if I have my slides up here. Do I have my slides up? I do indeed. There's only one man trying to go to that next slide. <laughs> Can I get that? Are you seeing any slides there? I don't yet hear, Bert. I just see the speakers up there. Ah, ah there we go. There we go. Now we do. Well, slight delay, Bert. Okay. Okay. So uh, that was sort of my opening slide here. I'm going to come back to that in the end, though, the, a poster with uh, the Russian language, America to starving Russia. Um, but going to the next slide, and I hope it kicks in in a moment, um, the only person in a position to do anything about this famine was Herbert Hoover in his capacity as chairman of the American Relief Administration, ARA. Since the end of the Great War, uh, building on the success of his uh, uh, relief to German-occupied uh, Belgium uh, during the war, Hoover's ARA executes this massive uh, food relief campaign across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, first as a U.S. government agency, there's Hoover. But then since 1919, since the middle of 1919, the ARA is a private organization, but really quasi-private, because Herbert Hoover at this time is Secretary of Commerce, and that would be in the Warren Harding administration. So he's in the administration, but he is uh, directing uh, the ARA and directing this huge uh, enterprise. So in that summer of 1921, after some delicate negotiations, Hoover's ARA enters Soviet Russia to fight this great famine. In the end, as Dr. Lakanti said, millions would die. A minimum figure you get is 5 million, maximum is 10 million. Millions more were saved, though, by American relief. And uh, as Dr. Lacanti said, in the summer of 1922, by then, uh, as we go to the next slide, American kitchens um, were feeding kitchens like this in Petrograd, nearly 11 million Soviet citizens a day. Now, to go back to that late summer of 1921, it was only the, when the first party of Americans who had made their way to Moscow, when that first party of Americans, we go to the next slide, makes its way to the Volga in early September, that the Americans realize what they have on their hands, how um, uh, extraordinary this, uh, this catastrophe is. The men of the ARA, young American men, mostly in their 20s, had had experience, most of them, as relief workers in places like Poland and Austria, but the hardship that they encountered there in Central Europe did not compare to the horrors they now witnessed in Soviet Russia. This was, unlike what they saw in Central and Eastern Europe, a large-scale famine brought on by the factors that uh, Dr. Lacanti mentions. The trigger was that drought. But this is a famine not in the cities, which is what they had expected. It's in the countryside. It's devastating those who produce the food. 
So the ARA scouting party um, gets to the Volga and encounters scenes like this. This is a small railway station um, along the Volga, in the Volga Valley. Hundreds of thousands are fleeing the famine, heading west, heading southwest to Ukraine. They're looking for food. Their refugee problem is enormous uh, for the following eight months at least. Next slide, please. The worst scenes of suffering the Americans came upon were in the so-called children's homes where you had, or receiving homes, where refugee children um, orphaned or abandoned by their parents were taken in. Countless descriptions by the Americans in that autumn of 1921 of walking into places like this, how the Americans dreaded it, how they were haunted by these scenes afterwards. The children would look at you in an absent sort of way, they wrote. There was none of the pleading for bread, typically, that they expected. Um, and it was massive. I mean, there were millions of cases like this. So we go to the next slide. That's the scene in the autumn of 1921. Hoover's original idea was to feed only, scare quote alert, only one million children. Soon that was increased to three million. And that would have made it easily the single largest ARA mission to date. But the facts on the ground would transform the mission into something much more ambitious. Those meals for children, they began to feed right away. Uh, a daily meal, it consisted of some combination of beans, rice, corn grits, bread, milk, lard, cocoa, very big, and sugar. But the American relief workers on the scene realized this was not going to be enough. And their reports out of Russia uh, indicated that in fact, much more was required. How can we feed the children and let their parents die? So that set the stage for a dramatic expansion of the mission. Next slide, in the winter of 1921-22, Hoover asked President Harding to approach Congress with a request for $20 million for food relief, together with other, other monies, by the way, over the course of the next two years, the tally would reach $60 million, equivalent to about $900 million uh, today, <clears throat> excuse me, today. And the idea is to purchase corn, to get the corn to the people on the Volga and in other regions, but also wheat seed. You need to save the harvest of 1922 if you're actually gonna put an end to this famine. So the essential story, of the mission is how the ARA, backed by this congressional appropriation of $20 million, undertakes this massive campaign to transport corn and the wheat seed from the American Midwest to the Russian heartland, break the back of the famine, and they secure the harvest of 1922. Next slide takes us to, um, yeah, to the map that gets you a little closer. Actually, on the previous one, if we go back to that map uh, for one second, I should have noted, you can see the supply routes coming in through uh, the north to the Baltic ports and the south to the Black Sea ports. And now we go in for a closer look. And you see uh, on the closer map, which should be coming up uh, in a moment, those are the, that's the railway network. You can see the Volga, I'm not sure you can see my cursor, but it's out toward the right there, the Volga River. Now the delivery of this relief proved to be a tremendous logistical challenge. This mission, people forget, they don't even think about this, but Hoover could have failed. This could have been a, a massive failure instead of what it became, which is kind of the crowning achievement of Hoover relief, at least relief abroad, because the obstacles to success were many, and one of the biggest is captured in the following photo, is the state of Russia's railroads. European Russia scarred with what the Americans call locomotive graveyards, rows of rusting, dilapidated locomotives, uh, like the one uh, that you see here. And the central drama of the story, and it's highlighted on this next map, is how the ARA, against the odds, and after a near disastrous jam up of corn trains west of the Volga, I don't think you can see my cursor, but you see those uh, congestion of dots there to the west of the Volga. Those are 
Each dot represents an entire train load of supplies, not a car, railroad car, but a train load of supplies. Um, they managed to break through the log jam, that's March 1922, and they got the corn and the seed to the villages in most cases in the nick of time breaking the back of the famine, and again later would go on to secure the harvest of 1922. But in the meantime, and this is the most difficult slide I will show you today, I've gone pretty light on the, uh, the, the, the horror photos, but the next photo gives an indication of what that winter was like. Um, this is Tsaritsyn on the lower Volga, later becomes Stalingrad. Um, after you're in the archives for a while, photos like this aren't so bad to look at because those children have moved beyond, right? It's when they're still alive and you're wondering how um, that makes it so difficult to look at. But these were scenes the Americans witnessed over and over again in that January, February, March, and into April 1922. Now, once the corn, let's get off that photo, and the seed reached the railheads, the challenge was to move the supplies to the interior, to the villages. And there are striking images, and I have some in my book, of horse and camel caravans transporting the corn over the frozen landscape, camels from Central Asia. And they came as far north as Tsaritsa, and you can see the word written in the lower right corner of the slide there. So, and by the way, that's Tsaritsa in the background, and that is the frozen Volga River. Uh, that the caravan is moving over. So once the corn gets out there and the ARA has kitchens set up, as we go to the next slide, I just want to show you two. I showed you a photo of the Petro a Petrograd kitchen earlier, but more typical of the ARA scene is are these two photos. So the first one that shows the exterior of uh, a children's kitchen where they're getting that one meal a day. And the second one, one of my favorite photos coming up now is shows the interior. This is quite a shot here. You can study those faces. Uh, look at that one in the sort of deep background here, right in the middle. Pretty remarkable. And then, you know, there's so much more to this story I could tell you, but I'll, you know, must mention, I'll wrap this up um, uh, by talking about this, that the ARA also uh, introduced a medical program something it had not done in its previous missions. Uh, the Russian conditions demanded it. And next slide shows an important part of the medical program. Oh, there's the, in Ufa, on the edge of Siberia, in the Urals. This is, uh, I, said, I think it says a convoy of 50 sleds. The next slide will show you that an important part of the medical program was inoculation. Um, the ARA imported, courtesy of the American Red Cross, Actually, the Pasteur Institute in Paris uh, sent the first vaccines. Uh, they were a tetra vaccine immunizing against cholera, typhoid, and paratyphoid A and B. Yes, there was resistance to getting the shot, um, but the ARA had leverage. You want your meal, uh, you get your shot, right? They didn't have proof of vaccination cards back then. So the mission would stay on in Soviet Russia for a second year on a reduced scale, the medical program, though, actually ramps up in the second year, um, and um, it's considered, this mission is considered a big success. Final slide. Millions would die, as we said in the beginning. Millions were saved. Notice this poster, by the way, which was done by a Russian uh, um, artist and widely distributed by the ARA within Russia. So that's his America up in the upper right obviously in Russian Cyrillic, and then to, at the bottom, to starving Russia. And I just want to make sure you see those ears of corn along the lower um, border of that poster. This poster shows up in many, many, many uh, photos along the way. So the ARA withdraws in the summer of 1923. And at that point, as you might imagine, its reputation within Soviet Russia and its legacy were vulnerable to every kind of Soviet slander. By the 1930s, under Stalin, the party line instructed that in fact the purpose of Hoover's ARA in Russia had been espionage under the cover of philanthropy. So there's a lot of uh, bad-mouthing the ARA. People who had worked 
for the Americans. There were only 200 Americans at any one time in the country, and over 100,000 local uh, or native, as the American calls them, employees. Some of those people paid a price for that association. So by the 1930s, the ARA is something Russians don't want to talk about. For the most part, the Soviet government ignored that story and its history, and it was slowly forgotten by the Soviet people. And it is still largely forgotten in Russia today. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Professor Pat. Now, that's just an absolutely stirring, fascinating. It's just it's um, it is really a staggering achievement that you've introduced us to. Uh, You've mentioned the obstacles, some of the obstacles that uh, Herbert Hoover and his team had to overcome. And that really takes us to George Nash now, who's going to have some uh, some reflections on that, particularly on Hoover's role and how he was prepared for, I think, in in many ways, the the challenge of a lifetime. But take it over uh, to George Nash. Hey, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Leconte, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your gracious introduction, and such a pleasure to be uh, at this function and to be in the company, as it were, via this long-distance uh, technology with my good friend and fellow historian, Bert Patnot. And I highly recommend his really splendid book uh, that was alluded to earlier. It's, it is a page-turner. In my uh, allotted time, I'd like to reflect mainly on the man who, more than anyone else, made this all happen, Herbert Hoover. And first, a bit of background. In 1914, Hoover was an internationally famous and highly successful mining engineer living in London when World War I broke out. And as most of you undoubtedly know, in those early weeks, the Germans overran neutral Belgium in their attempt to uh, win the war quickly against France and Great Britain. Now, Belgium was dependent upon imported food for most of its consumption, yet it was now trapped behind, uh, between, really, an enemy occupier, a hostile occupier, Germany, and a British naval blockade of the ports. And now, under those circumstances, the civilian population of Belgium faced starvation on a mass scale unless food supplies could somehow be obtained from the outside world. Well... Hoover was already well known in London. He uh, masterfully helped repatriate about 100,000 American refugees fleeing the war in its opening weeks. And with the approval of the American ambassador and the acquiescence of the British and German governments, he was permitted as a private citizen of a neutral country, but living in London, to establish in the fall of 14 a benevolent organization called the CRB, or Commission for Relief in Belgium to purchase transport and deliver food through the blockade to the beleaguered Belgian populace and nobody else, not the German army, obviously. No one anticipated that this emergency humanitarian mission would last more than a few months. But as the clash of giant armies degenerated into a gruesome stalemate on the Western Front, Hoover's emergency relief undertaking for Belgium turned into an elaborate enterprise without precedent in human history an organized rescue of an entire nation from the threat of starvation amid enemy enemy occupation in the midst of a war. For the rest of the war, Hoover and his fellow volunteers of the CRB, mostly Americans, supplied successfully sufficient food to keep more than 7 million Belgian civilians alive, as well as more than 2 million French civilians who were subsisting in German-occupied French territory just behind the front lines. In the course of all this, Hoover, working without pay, became an international hero, the embodiment of a new force in global politics, namely American benevolence in the form of humanitarian aid programs. When the United States entered the war in 1917, Hoover came home. The Belgian relief continued under under underlings, but he still had oversight. He joined the uh, Wilson administration, became U.S. food administrator, and at the end of the war was dispatched by President Wilson back to Europe to help take charge, or really to take charge, who was always the one to take charge, of food (laughs) distribution in a continent exhausted by war and threatened by hunger and disease. 
he became director general of relief and head of what uh, Dr. Patnod referred to mentioned of the American Relief Administration as a government agency with a $100 million congressional appropriation, which then orchestrated the distribution of food to literally millions of desperate people in more than 20 nations. Famine is the mother of anarchy, Hoover told his staff as that began, that uh, operation began. He said, from the inability of governments to secure food for their people grows revolution and chaos. From an ability to supply their people grows stability of government and defeat of anarchy. He openly identified his political foe in Europe as revolutionary Bolshevism. An enemy of civilization, he called it. It was spreading like a disease across Europe, capitalizing on what he called the fear of famine as well as actual famine. And he argued quite directly that the tide of Bolshevism, his phrase, must be stopped. And food, not arms, was the best way to stop it because it would keep restive populations in big cities like Vienna and elsewhere from succumbing to the temptation of overthrowing the government, putting in a communist regime and discompopulating the whole economy of Central Europe. So Hoover was outspoken in his anti-communism. He denounced the, the Bolshevik regime as a murderous tyranny led by a group of mi mixed idealists and murderers. And he made plain that his giant relief enterprise, which was literally saving millions of lives, was not to be an ordinary humanitarian mission because its objective was not simply the alleviation of individual suffering, important and primary, though that was in the immediate sense, but also, as he said, the maintenance of public order and the preservation of civilization itself against the emerging challenge from Leninist revolution sweeping in from the East. Toward the end of his life, he wrote that his relief efforts in 19 had been, in his words, indeed a race against both death and communism. And I think that's a key to understanding Hoover's motivation in much of, of what he did in 1921 to 23 in Russia. In Hoover's mind, both objectives, being against death and communism, were intertwined profoundly. He did not see some great disjunction between them. Or perhaps it would be better to say that for him, both objectives were seamlessly complementary and equally righteous. As Bertrand Patnod has uh, is explained in his book, and I'll quote him here, uh, I agree with this uh, observation that he made, quote, to Hoover, just as to Wilson and to most Western statesmen at the time, Bolshevism was a symptom of people in distress, thus fighting Bolshevism was humanitarian. Or humanitarian, yes, was humanitarianism, okay? So, Hoover's campaign in Russia is against death and communism, and we've just gotten a wonderful oversight of that from this slide presentation. It was humanitarian in the sense that Hoover and the ARA adhered very strictly to their business. Uh, there was no espionage, no anti-Bolshevik agitation on the part of Hoover's men, no overtly counter-revolutionary activity. But the communist regime was worried. Lenin hated Hoover and was worried that, that Hoover who had uh, helped prop up the anti-Bolshevik sentiment in Central Europe, might be trying in some nefarious way to undermine the Soviet regime. At one point during the negotiations that set up the ARA, Lenin wrote to Molotov, Hoover must be punished. He must be slapped publicly before the whole world. And he called Hoover and his associate, Walter Lyman Brown, Hoover's director in Europe, insolent liars. But... The regime felt desperate. It felt threatened. It was worried especially about unrest potentially in the cities where they had their power base, not in the countryside so much. And um, they had to accept Hoover uh, to come, come in. But I do think it's fair to say and proper to say that Hoover did have a kind of what he saw as a humane political aspiration, not by some kind of active work on his part, but by example the ARA could stand as an example of American efficiency, humanitarianism, fairness, humaneness, in stark contrast to what the peasants had experienced from Bolshevik terror and incompetence. So we hoped that at that point, the regime, which seemed to be tottering, might collapse 
and out of the collapse could come something better, something more stable, a post, post-Bolshevik post regime, which might, I think, Hoover hoped, uh, turn to this American example as a kind of inspiration for a better path. And now just in summary, then, I want to establish uh, the, the larger context for what we are discussing this afternoon by pointing this out. Between 1914 and 1923, Hoover directed, financed, or assisted a multitude of international humanitarian relief efforts without parallel in history. During that nearly 10-year period, the CRB first and then the ARA and other private organizations that worked uh, sometimes in tandem with Hoover and other governments to some extent, delivered in total, most of it from American sources, nearly 34 million metric tons of food to the nations imperiled by the war and its aftermath. And the value of that aid would exceed $60 billion in today's currency. And for most of the undertaking, the man with supreme responsibility was Hoover. Tens of millions of people, not only in Russia, but in those other countries that were mentioned before, owed their lives to his exertions. And thus it was later said of him that he was responsible for saving more lives than any other person in history. Late in his life, Hoover turned back to the uh, this in his recollections and between 19... 59 and 1964, when he died at the age of 90, he published, he wrote and published a four volume set of, of, of studies on what he called an American epic, the story of American enterprises in compassion, as he called them. And he said that for thousands of years, the question, am I my brother's keeper, has echoed in the conscience of mankind. The American people were the first in history, he said, to accept that obligation as a nation. And he worried, even then, that Americans were forgetting, and he hoped that they never would. And so I think it's important to see that this whole Hoover effort, in many ways, was not a, just an episode of the Great War and its terrible aftermath, but a pioneering effort in global philanthropy which really was a forerunner of the vast transnational network relief agencies that we take for granted today. And so I think it is thanks to events like this one, in which I'm very happy to participate, that now perhaps more Americans will remember the history that Hoover wanted them to remember. So thank you. Uh, Professor Nash, just a splendid summary of, of Herbert Hoover's uh, achievement and how he really appeared to be the man for the moment. It's really hard to conceive of another individual who was better prepared to take on this enormous task. And I want to turn it over to, to the both of you now to have maybe a discussion among yourselves for a bit. We have some questions in the queue, and I want to encourage our audience to put some questions there in the box. I promise I'll get to as many as possible. But maybe uh, between the two of you gentlemen, it might be worth, uh, if there are points you want to underscore, what what don't most people understand about this humanitarian mission that they really do need to understand, particularly in the current moment. And by the current moment, I think I mean, oh, a good deal of self-doubt in the United States, self-doubt about, about Western civilization, what, what we can do, the use of American soft power. We have no shortage of humanitarian crises in the world today. What, what do we need to recall, do you think, gentlemen, uh, about this moment, given our own current moment. Uh, and maybe Professor Poutnett, if you could take that first, and we'll go back to, to Dr. Nash. Yeah, so, um, and you can hear me okay, is that right? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, as Dr. Nash would be, uh, uh, probably would say right after me, Herbert Hoover was um, uh, known as the master of efficiency, uh, the master of emergencies, right? And he really did represent a kind of can-do spirit that I think you're right, Joe, that yeah, we, we look, can look back to with nostalgia these days, right? I mean, the, 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 the fact that this man could orchestrate and look, but bringing together around him very impressive individuals as well, right? I mean, his team, uh, he knew how to delegate. He was a control freak, but he knew how to delegate, and he... Uh, attracted the top talent, and they were intensely loyal to him. And if Hoover wanted it done, they would do it, 
And they later wrote about this. You know, this was, the, for a lot of these Americans, you can imagine, this was the highlight of their lives, right? These, uh, these um, relief efforts. So, yeah, I think looking back, um, I, from today's vantage point, I think the idea that America led the way in this way um, and also that Herbert Hoover was on the scene, because I think George would agree that there really was nobody else with the business sense, the administrative acumen, and a kind of quiet charisma that enabled him to, to achieve such success, I think. Wow. So, wow. yeah, I'm hoping Americans will look back on this and say, we, can, we could do that. We, could, you know, we should be able to do such things today. Wow. Dr. Nash, do you want to uh, take that question as well? Uh, you've, you've already suggested some of these elements, but what else about this? Uh, I can't, I'm going to use the word staggering again, because I, I, every time I think about what they achieved in the face of unspeakable obstacles and unspeakable suffering, what they achieved, it's astonishing. So I'm, I'm, I want to keep pressing this point. What would you say we need to recall Lessons we need to recall, given the current moment of self-loathing and insecurity here in America and in the West. Well, one thing that comes to mind is uh, John Maynard Keynes's comment about Hoover uh, in his book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. I believe it was called in 1920. Keynes and Hoover were uh, acquainted at the time of the Paris peace talks. And he said Hoover was the uh, the only person to emerge from the ordeal of Paris, that is the treaty making of Treaty of Versailles, with an enhanced reputation. <laughs> and one thing that I think made Hoover such an international hero was that he made his reputation in the midst of and because of a war, but in a non-military way. He was not a diplomat, a statesman, a head of state, a general. But here he was saving lives at a time when something close to 10 million men in uniform died in World War I and another 20 million people or so were apparently uh, something like that uh, injured. You know, a horrific tragedy. And so Hoover stands out for this and he becomes then this personification of American benevolence. He, one of British diplomats said he was kind of an advance agent in the CRB of this sense of American responsibility to Europe. And I think that that is quite important uh, in assessing, uh, understanding why Hoover and the Americans had such such uh, power. I mean, Hoover had a it's like a Hoover passport. He just had a little statement, and he, all you had to do is wave that piece of paper signed by Herbert Hoover as you go as you an American uh, soldier or relief worker going through Central Europe in 1919. This is uh, America. America was kind of this miraculous entity across the seas, providing this food, not. Wow carving out uh, territory for itself, not having some kind of, um, you know, a balance of power intention that would uh, yes. tarnish its motives. So all yes. of that, I think, uh, made uh, Hoover and America very popular at the time. And it really then set a kind of precedent for, let's say, the Marshall Plan after World War II, the uh, foundation of CARE, uh, uh, UNICEF, that was partly brought about by the inspiration of Hoover. So this lasted quite a while, this sense yeah. that Americans were, uh, a ki Americans were a kind of a generous people. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's useful to just to reflect on that at a time when people say that uh, every nation has only ma malevolent motives or whatever. And, and so this stood out, uh, I think, in contrast, that experience is an example, as Bert yes. rightly put it, of, of can-do efficiency and efficiency for a humane purpose, not for the yes. purpose of repression or imperialism. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, an, inc an incredible example of uh, the projection of American soft power as we say in diplomatic terms, not hard power, but soft power. Let me get to some of the questions in the queue here from West Culp. We got one. How closely, if at all, did the ARA staff work with the local Bolshev uh, Bolshevik authorities? Talking about that that tension, perhaps, uh, Dr. Pettenhout, you could uh, jump on that. And then, uh, uh, Dr. Nash, you can also follow up. How closely did they work with the, with the Bolsheviks? Yeah, so this is a, a part of the story that I was very tempted to try to shoehorn in, but I, uh, I thought it would just, I would get off the track. So they had to work with local government authorities. Absolutely had to. They needed their cooperation. They did get some cooperation. I mean, the Bolsheviks are going to be suspicious, not about diverting food to their enemies, but they were really worried about this example of efficiency um, and making them look bad. 
So they're trying to get control over the, um, the relief supplies. They're trying to get the credit for it. They're telling people lies about how this is paid for by the Soviet government or being supplied by the American proletariat, you know, this kind of thing. And that's why the Americans made those posters. There was another one they made as well to get the word out that this is a gift from America, the American nation, and not the proletariat. So they had, um, in some places, better cooperation than others. There are a lot of fights, in a couple of cases, fistfights. But the real complication, and it's a great part of the story, is that Moscow decided to send... Um, agents from the center to each of the ARA districts as kind of minders. So these are secret policemen, part of the Cheka, right, the original secret police. And they were the ones who really stirred up the trouble. There were good, better ones or, you know, less worse ones. But the interesting thing is that the Moscow people, agents, and the local representatives were often clashing. And that led to a lot of inefficiency. And these Americans could barely control their anger. We're trying to save lives here, and you guys are having a turf war. Um, so there's a, it's, it's a big part of the story, and it's mixed, uh, but it's a good question. So thanks for that, Wes. Wow, fabulous. Um, I've got another question here in the queue, and Dr. Nash, feel free to jump in over here. Uh, this is taking, taking us a little bit more closer to our period. Did Hoover's relief effort in Russia inspire JFK to create USAID? Not, that, not that, I, that I'm aware of. However, uh, Kennedy did ask Hoover, I think it was, to become, or I know it was Hoover to become, I think it was a uh, nominal head, a kind of an honorary president of the Peace Corps. And um, I, I think Hoover declined. He was like 88 or 9 years old and so forth. But he, he was friendly with the, with the Kennedy family. And Kennedy was brought up, uh, the Kennedy children, to respect Herbert Hoover. Yeah. And uh, so I, I would not know specifically whether uh, Hoover's relief was on, the, on President Kennedy's mind. But uh, certainly Hoover was, uh, was uh, re respected and admired by that point in his life. He had outlived his enemies, as he put it at one point. And so he was remembered particularly for the uh, relief work that he had done after yeah. World War World War One. If I could just interject one little point on this, uh, not about Kennedy, but about Harry Truman. Harry Truman brought back Hoover from a kind of internal exile after Roosevelt's death. And in 1946 and 47, Truman sent Hoover abroad to well, well over 30 countries on an international famine relief survey to determine the needs of prostrate Europe and Asia after the Second World War. Hoover did not administer relief, but he was a troubleshooter and wanted to bring his great prestige to make that happen. So Hoover had a kind of a second act, if you will, after World War II in a somewhat different way, but as okay. this symbol of American generosity and efficiency yes. and expertise. He knew what he yes. was doing. And he knew what he was yes. doing as a humanitarian. And so Truman recognized that. I would not be surprised if Kennedy in some sense did, although I can't say specifically that it inspired uh, the USAID. That's fascinating. You know, one of the things that occurs to me here as we're talking is that in a way that George Washington as the first president set, set the mold, he set a, a, a standard for what the chief executive uh, would be like, how he would function, how he would govern, but also embodying the best of the American creed. And, and Washington was very conscious of that. I wonder if in a similar way, and we can talk about this perhaps a little bit, I wonder if in a similar way that Herbert Hoover, as America is really entering the, the world stage for the first time in a major way here in the First World War, he's helping to establish, well, what is, how is America going to behave in the world now as a world power? Maybe you gentlemen could comment on that. Uh, not only Hoover, of course, but the, the American Relief Administration effort in, in the Soviet Union. What message is that sending to the rest of the world, both communist and non-communist, would you say, in the 1920s, right up through the 1930s? Well, you know, let me, I, I, sorry, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, let me just uh, say, make a brief remark and, and tee this up for George, which is that um, Hoover, uh, I think, I'm not exaggerating here uh, when I say he was distraught when he learned the peace terms of the Treaty of Versailles and addressed um, at least one letter I've seen to, to Woodrow Wilson trying to make the case that this is not the way forward 
And he was not certainly not an isolationist. And when he came back to America, actually early in uh, 1919, uh, or not early in the year, but uh, toward the end of 1919, he was concerned that we would stop engaging with Europe with relief and diplomacy. Europe still needed our help, right? So I, there's that. And on the other hand, I think it was a mistake for the ARA to withdraw uh, when it did as, as abruptly as it did. If you look at what the Americans on the ground say, and I mean the chiefs uh, in Moscow, they thought that somehow the ARA ought to, um, uh, you know, serve as a as a um, as a conduit towards some sort of trade relationship. That we needed to kill the Soviets, the Soviet government. We need to kill it, but kill it with kindness, and we needed to engage it and bring it out of its shell. But instead, the ARA left, and Soviet Russia was isolated, and we know that what happens after that. Fascinating. Dr. Nash, you want to pick up that question about the, the, the image of the United States that uh, Hoover and his efforts uh, in the Soviet Union, what, what, is it, what message is it sending to the, to the rest of the world, do you think? Well, I think he wanted it to be a, a, a message that America was a, a, a nation that did not have selfish, a selfish interests in manipulating Europe. Uh, he, when he came back in 1919, as uh, uh, Bert just mentioned, Hoover initially favored the uh, Versailles Treaty's ratification, even though he was upset very much by some of its uh, what he saw as draconian terms, and he thought it was laying the seeds for another war. Uh, but he gradually came to the position that it ought to be uh, uh, ratified with reservations because there was so much opposition uh, to Wilson. But Hoover wanted that, not so much because he thought the political settlement that it, it embodied was so great, but because he thought Europe needed stability to recover. It needed prosperity and you needed to have a sense of being at peace again. And so his uh, interest was that that Europe should be revived in that way. And I think he saw also that that this example of American generosity with with food shipments and so forth might lead to trade opportunities for the United States. That was part of his thinking. Um, all nations, I suppose, have some those sight, sorts of concerns in mind at some point. And uh, he wanted, therefore, to uh, set a good example. But he did come back, as he said in that little volume, American Individualism, that he published in 1922. He came back with a sense that Europe, in some ways, was hopeless politically. And particularly <laughs> that Bolshevism had shown the failure of socialism. It had foundered on the rock of production. It could not motivate people to create a stable, prosperous, generous society. And he was very worried that what he called foreign social diseases, meaning ideologies, would come over from Europe, various kinds of, of governmental interventionism. So he sees America in contrast then to Europe. Yes. He still yes. has this great humanitarian, sincere concern for the suffering, particularly of children. But he doesn't want America to get too involved in governmental relations or military alliances like that. So there's a certain tension in his thinking that way. But he, yes. he wanted uh, he, he became really increasingly an advocate or an embodiment, if you will, of what we like to call today American exceptionalism. So yes. he thought that America should best be a beacon of liberty and and of decency for the world without trying to embroil itself in, in European problems. So yes, I, I would you. say that would be part of the uh, the mix here that we should understand. Yeah, that's a terrific summary. I want to I want to take us back. We got a little bit of time left here. I want to take us back uh, to uh, one of the issues that uh, Dr. Patton had raised is the obstacles that had to be overcome, and maybe just a little bit more reflection on this from both you gentlemen mm -hmm. when you think about the most fearsome, daunting obstacles that Hoover and his team had to overcome, whether that's in terms of the, you know, the Russian railroad system, such as it was, the meddling from, uh, from the apparatchiks, et cetera. What would you put on that list and how were they able to do it? How were they able to break through those obstacles? Yeah, so if I could just start and, you know, we should mention the elements, uh, the Russian winter and um, as problematic, the Russian spring. Uh, which uh, came early and then was reversed. Uh, that helped to keep the, uh, the Volga River frozen and so they could keep those uh, supply chains going, right? Wow. So that's one thing. 
But the biggest problem was, uh, I think, uh, they're dealing with a, a people that is exhausted from years of war, revolution, civil war, and um, from food deprivation. These people have no jazz, as the Americans like to say. Um, but they're also dealing with, with what they regard as, and you have to be careful when you, when you uh, talk about national stereotypes like this, but they're also dealing with um, uh, people who they see as fatalistic. Um, I think a lot of this is related to being run down over the years by events and lack of food. But they, they look at the Russians and they, and they think they're inefficient. They have no jazz. They can't get up and help themselves. They're putting themselves in the hand of God, etc. And many of the Americans, if they weren't engineers, were engineer minded. And so they, a big obstacle to them was the people they were trying to save because they needed their help. They were there as administrators, American Relief Administration. So there were only 200 max at any one time, and the Russians had to do a lot of the work. So that's a problem. Wow, that's huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to probably miss the, 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 the force of that point, isn't it, uh, Dr. Patnow? Because a couple of hundred Americans scattered across this vast territory, which what you're saying is it really did have to come down to the, the the Russians themselves, the Soviet citizens themselves, somehow finding the motivation and, and finding the hope that they can turn this thing around. Astonishing. Right. And to add to that, if I can add one thing to that, the best people that they could employ would be people who maybe spoke a foreign language, people who had been somebody under the old regime. Those yeah. are the people the Bolsheviks don't want the Americans to be associated with. Wow. And so that's where a lot of the clashes come in, arrests of the ARA employees, et cetera. Wow. Fascinating. Dr. Nash, do you want to take that, that question? Uh, the, uh, some of the most fearsome obstacles that Hoover and his team had to overcome, lessons for us? Well, I, I think one of them has already been alluded to, but I would like to underscore it, uh, namely the uh, hostility and suspicion of the Bolshevik leaders. Uh, in early 22, and, and Dr. Patinod would, would know uh, a lot about this, I'm sure, more than I do, the uh, Lenin uh, went decided to launch a campaign against another one of his great ideological enemies, the Russian Orthodox Church. And so many churches were closed, ransacked, their icons stolen, and Lenin spread the lie that this was being done because the ARA needed the money to provide the food, provide the food to the peasants. So he was trying to draw, draw a wedge between the ARA and the peasants, lest the peasants, I suppose, get ideas about the good Americans and the not so good people uh, in the communist regime. So that was uh, that has struck me in doing research on this, how much uh, the Bolsheviks tried to undermine and for uh, reasons of obvious of so control of the population, uh, the ARA effort. I would also add Add to the mix a less um, vital obstacle or a less serious obstacle, but it was one that Hoover had to navigate around, and that it was there was a lot of American anti-communist sentiment that said, "Why should we feed our enemies?" Here, the Bolsheviks just a few years ago they were trying to overrun Europe, uh, etc. Why should we do this? And Hoover, with his immense humanitarian reputation, was able to overcome that. He had a good rapport with President Harding, who supported him. The Congress approved the appropriation uh, by you know, heavy majorities, and it helped that it was providing money that would be used to buy American corn from American farmers so they could get a little prosperity there, that corn to be sent over to, to uh, the Soviet Union. So Hoover also was under pressure from the American left, which, which thought that because of his pre-war mining holdings in Russia, which he basically sold out of before the revolution, actually, uh, that that somehow meant that he was a, a, a sour, bitter, embittered capitalist looking for some way to recover his lost properties or something like that. They had all these notions that Hoover had these, these nefarious... Uh, purposes. And that, of course, was tandem in a way with what the Bolsheviks were saying, that they couldn't believe yeah. that anyone could be this um, generous uh, and, and yes. humanitarian. They must have some uh, ulterior motive. So Hoover had to put up with opposition from yes. the American far left, which, uh, you know, Hoover being very sensitive to criticism, did not enjoy one bit. So that was, you know, another thing that he had to take account yeah. of, um, the American public sentiment. And he did, if I could uh, interject that quickly, Dr. Nash, he did endure, it seems to me, criticism both from the American left and, of course, from the Soviet uh, apparatchiks who, who would be uh, bad-mouthing him publicly. Was, was there some of that? I mean, he could have 
he could have, uh, it seems to me, uh, pushed back against that publicly. But what? how did that play out, if you could just take a moment on that? Well, he never uh, he never forgot uh, what the communists did. Uh, is as I think uh, Dr. Patton had mentioned, initially the Russians in 1923 uh, had a, a farewell ceremony, or maybe you'll want to say more about that, uh, to thank the ARA for all it did. But that quickly disappeared from the party line, so to speak. Yeah. And then Hoover at home in the Depression was accused of not caring about Americans at home, and so he lost some of his luster at that point. Uh, I don't think it's fair to um, to say that he didn't care uh, uh, at all about Americans. Uh, one difference, I'm sure, in Hoover's mind was that the Americans had a network of people of volunteer effort, that American spirit that included the United Way, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross. So Americans, for the purpose of responding to economic hardship, according to Hoover, had a much better preparation for it uh, psychologically and institutionally than the Russian peasantry did. So I don't think he saw the need for the United States to have the kind of massive government interventionism of, of, of uh, emergency proportions as was obviously necessary in Russia a decade earlier. But yes. that did, some people on the left attacked Hoover and said, well, you're great at feeding the Europeans, but why don't you care about your own people? And yeah. I think that hurt him very much, and he fought back against it in various ways, which... Interesting. Uh, made- Interesting. We're running out of time here, John, but I, I want to give Dr. Patton now the last word here, because I know you you have thought and researched and written about this topic, I think more than anyone. Uh, we're so delighted to have both you and Dr. Nash. I think you are the two best people in the world to have on this topic uh, today. And I say that without any sense of exaggeration. So I want to give Dr. Patton out uh, uh, another moment just to maybe give us a closing thought here that you'd like to leave sure. us with. A uh, couple of things and sparked by uh, what George Nash just said. I do think the Soviets were trying to bully the ARA so that they somehow could leverage this relief mission into diplomatic recognition. And when it did not happen, they were very, very, very uh, uh, unhappy about that. And, um, you know, within a short time turned on the ARA. So that's one thing. The other thing is that George reminds me that I often use the phrase for Herbert Hoover's leadership of this mission, Nixon in China. You know, just as Richard Nixon was the only person you could imagine back then, the only president, Uh, Going to China, Nixon with his impeccable um, anti-communist credentials, right? Herbert Hoover, I mean, aside from being master of emergencies and so on, no one was going to question Hoover's anti-Bolshevik credentials back then. So that was a big plus. And then the other thing against the background, what Hoover had to deal with, the U.S. economy was in a depression. Uh, He called it that in 1921. And you could sense what we today would call compassion fatigue. Right. People had really just about had it. So he really had to finesse this. And especially because it's going to Russia, where the ideological enemy is. Um, So it really in so many ways, when you look at this episode, um, Herbert Hoover had to master so many dimensions, diplomacy, logistics and so on. So I think it's a one of a kind in that sense. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, Good. Tremendous obstacles, both at home and of course abroad. And this is an example from, in my mind as an historian, how an individual, of course, with many, many helping him, but individual personalities, individual leadership, men and women, it makes an incredible difference. And in this case, saved millions, untold millions of, of human lives from, from death. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible story. I wanna thank both you gentlemen uh, for joining us. Thank you for our audience for joining us here. Uh, we've got full biographies of both these men on the website. There's an essay that I did with my colleague Alexis Morakchik uh, also on this on this issue over at Heritage.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.